So just hang in there. We'll kind of get to that. But in the meantime, we need to talk, switch gears from talking, um, well, we're still talking about global winds, the macro scale, planetary scale winds. Okay, that's one of the things. Now, when we talked, last time we were in here, we talked about the Hadley, Farrell, and Polar cells. And it gets a little, makes my mind spin a little bit because we have to talk about what's happening on the surface and what's happening upper elevations. So here we're switching gears again back to just upper elevations. And I hope one of the things, as you leave this class, you have a sense for at upper elevations, the wind is um, westerly, which means it's coming from the west at upper elevations. And now that includes under all cells. That's the, the Hadley, the Farrell, and the Polar Cell all has a westerly wind. And that's kind of what we're switching gears to talk about again today. Um, so the winds are kind of like a conveyor belt in some ways. Yeah, it is. It is. It definitely is. So this is kind of a repeat idea. We talked about um, great, uh, geostrophic winds. Actually, I think in Chapter 6 we talked about geostrophic winds. Again, at upper elevations, okay? Geostrophic winds is basically that westerly wind that kind of is happening at upper elevations. And you have kind of these, yeah, kind of like, like these cells, and they have kind of surface winds that go. We talked about, you know, we spent some time last week talking about the, the easterly trade winds, the mid-latitude westerlies, and the polar easterlies. So kind of superimposed on that, we have this. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's interesting. And of course, the reason anytime you have wind, it, it's always air going from a high to a low pressure. So this actually kind of talks you through where that high and that low pressure comes from. And the Coriolis force, you know, gives us these uh, geostrophic winds. Is this the next slide? Or is this the previous slide? Oops. Okay. So I know these two slides have the same figure. So it's like deja vu, two slides have the same figure. So this is the next slide with the different words. Um, I like this slide because it talks again about, reinforces, we talked about the drag of the friction of the earth and that as you go away from the earth, you lose that friction so winds go faster. You have kind of a homework question, I think, about that in chapter six. Um, and then the other thing is the pressure gradient force gets stronger at upper elevations. It's my understanding, though, as you transition from the troposphere into the stratosphere, the winds start getting less. I think that's kind of neat. All right, so geostrophic winds compared to gradient winds, which are your curvy winds. So we need to spend a little bit of time talking about these jet streams. So when I think about jet streams, I kind of think about the movie Finding Nemo, and the yeah. <laughs> he rides the turtle on the, yeah. <laughs> That fast-moving water kind of reminds me of this fast-moving air. <laughs> so um, I'm going to let Dirk, who is a meteorologist, actually kind of talk about this, if he will. And you're counting on getting from point A to point B. <laughs> you, again, like the jets, want to find that jet stream. And um, it's been known if it peters out kind of like Mother Nature just kind of does her own thing. I mean, she follows the laws of physics pretty good. But if it peters out, it can leave a balloon that's stranded. So something to think about. Yep. <laughs> so he talked about two jet streams. We're going to look, take a look at both of them. Now, the jet streams are kind of between those three cells we talked about last, or this week. Those three cells, the Hadley, the Farrell, and the Polar. Okay. You're going to see here in a minute that the subtropical jets between the Hadley and the Farrell, and the Polar jet is between the Farrell and the Polar. So it's kind of nice, like when things work out like that. Um, so here we have, we've been kind of looking at this sort of scenario before, where, of course, this is your surface. And then what your author's done over here on the left is to kind of show what's happening above off your surface. And you can see the three cells we've been talking about, um, the Hadley cell, the Farrell cell, and the Polar cell, OK, kind of three-dimensional there. And then there's ribbon. You know, it's kind of going around. The ribbon of air here is the polar jet between the Farrell and the polar, and the subtropical jet between the Hadley and the Farrell. So it's kind of nice when it makes sense like that. Um, and then I think I mentioned this before, but again, your polar front, and we'll be talking more in, in uh, chapter eight about air masses and chapter nine about fronts. But a front is just basically where you have clashing air, okay? 
So the clashing air, of course, here is warm air here and cold air here. Warm air with your feral cell, cold air with your polar cell. So pretty cool. Um, so the polar jet, here we kind of see a fair bit of, I'm going to use the word meandering here in a minute. Like if somebody just kind of meanders down the hall, they're like, oh, I could go here. I could. That's kind of what um, <laughs> the uh, jet streams kind of do sometimes. Um, um, it's strongest in the winter and weakest in the summer. Okay. So here you're seeing two polar jet streams. Of course, the summertime, it's kind of like we said, in the summertime in the, in the northern hemisphere, everything moves north. That includes the intertropical convergence zone and all the three cells. Okay. And in the winter, everything moves south. Okay. So you're actually kind of seeing, seeing that with a uh, uh, polar jet stream. This is uh, summer and this is in the winter. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. OK. So changing gears to the other jet stream, the subtropical jet stream that's between the Hadley and the feral cells, in both hemispheres, by the way. So the subtropical jet, like um, Dirk said, uh, tends to kind of be maybe southern US kind of gets that. But otherwise, it's not really a player. Um, there's a third jet stream we're going to call the nocturnal, uh, low-level nocturnal jet stream when we talk about severe weather that actually is more of a player than the subtropical jet stream. Okay, so switching gears from our jet streams to kind of our meandering a little bit. The general pattern of airflow at upper elevations, that westerly airflow, that geostrophic wind, okay, that actually doesn't always go due west to east. Sometimes it, and I, this is the meander, it, it meanders south and it meanders north. It meanders south and it meanders north. Okay. So this is kind of, I've mapped out, like Dirk was saying, this is kind of that line I drew up there. It could be the jet stream, the fast moving air. And then either side of it, it's a little bit slow, but the slower moving air kind of contours the fast moving air, kind of. Um, so they make these Rossby waves. I think the S is, is soft in Rossby waves, um, pronounced soft. Um, and so as I've drawn it here, let's see, trough to trough, I basically have one and a half Rossby waves up here. Okay. So like this says, you can have from three to six Rossby waves. And the way you know what your Rossby waves, the way they're defined, would be through the jet streams. So a trough or ridge, is that one wave? Um, trough to trough would be one wave. Yeah. It's the repeating, yeah. Or we could go ridge to ridge. So that's why it kind of looks like one and a half up there. Now, we don't always have kind of this sort of meandering going on in our, in our upper air patterns. It's not always there. So um, let me put this whole thing up here. So what I kind of want you to start thinking is, does this make sense that, you know, what I've drawn is kind of what upper, what are that geostrophic wind is doing, what that upper elevation wind is going from our west to our east. But in the northern hemisphere, notice I've drawn cold air right here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And warm air right here. This is kind of bringing cold. This is bringing warm. So that's, to me, what I kind of think of when I think of these next few days. I kind of think of this whole, this whole wave, this whole wave moving this way, OK? So to me, that's kind of somehow, sometimes what we get are alternating, our alternating cold, warm, cold, OK, in a sense. It's one reason. Um, oops. So Dirk actually mentioned this idea. He kind of near the end of his thing, he had the L where it was raining. The low pressures usually bring precipitation. High pressures usually bring dry conditions. And if you don't have kind of this Rossby, if you don't have these Rossby waves with meandering, the straight flat thing, I'm going to use the word zonal here in a minute, if it's just flat lining, basically sometimes you can get whatever's there is going to stay there because there's nothing to sweep it downstream as much. 
Okay, so it stalls out, and that's kind of what he talked about. It could stall out good or it could stall out bad. <laughs> oh. Okay, so we have two different kind of scenarios at upper elevations. This meandering, this meridional flow with meandering, I don't know if you can see meandering and meridional. Okay, meandering, meridional, that's the up and down and up and down. That's, this is meridional. Okay, zonal flow would be, mean at upper elevations, basically you may not even have a jet stream that's very strong, but zonal just means it's without any ups or downs. So if you do have zonal flow, no ups or downs, kind of like I said, um, you're going to have constant weather. To me, that makes sense because you're just like, dude, what we got is what we're going to keep. Okay. There's, well, we'll be talking about weather patterns kind of. But, um, and if you do have meridional flow, a little bit of Rossby wave going on there, um, then that is a way to transfer cold air down and warm air up. So kind of what I've drawn here are, are Rossby waves. To me, Rossby waves and meridional flow kind of go together. Rossby waves, meridional flow. Um, um, if you have this in place, um, oftentimes you'll have this lows associated with troughs, and we've already kind of talked about that in this class, and highs will be associated with ridges. But now finally we can kind of say, well, what defines a trough and a ridge? And now you're like, oh, okay. That's that, what the air is doing at upper elevations. And I've called it the jet stream. It may or may not be the jet stream. Okay. Um, yeah. And then this slide kind of reinforces one of the things that you're supposed to know in this class. I'll be tested over in your Unit 3 exam. Is anytime you see a low, hopefully you're thinking cyclone. Like the head, like a one eye in the middle of his head. And hopefully highs, you're thinking anti-cyclone. And in the northern hemisphere, hopefully you're thinking counterclockwise around a low, bless you, and clockwise around a high. And actually, if you go back and visit Dirk's animation, that's exactly what he did with his lows and his highs when we talked about stalling out. So on the next slide, I'm going to talk about this pinching off business. Okay, this pinching off business. The way I think of it is kind of if your Rossby waves kind of start to kind of, kind of straighten out, what can happen is basically a lobe of stuff, okay? As this starts to kind of straighten out, a lobe of stuff can be kind of sent on its way. And you'll see what I mean. And usually it's sent from north to south. So it looks like this. So this is a lobe of stuff being sent on its way. So the way you read this is from, uh, right, from left to right and from top to bottom. So it goes like this. This is number one, number two, number three. Almost looks like a vesicle leaving a Golgi body. Like, yeah, <laughs> what you said, biological process. Yep, number four. It's expelling, right? Okay, so up here, to me, and like the slide says, I would call that kind of zonal flow. I don't see much north and south movement. It's in the zone. Here we kind of have a little bit of meridional flow, a Rossby waves being created. Um, here we have kind of a pinching off, getting ready to straighten out for position four. And you can kind of see where that stuff just kind of gets sent on its way. If you've ever heard of the, um, oh my gosh, it was two years ago, the polar vortex, the whole thing where we had like negative 20s. I don't know, that was terrible. Uh, yeah, it's terrible. Um, and this is kind of a little bit what happened up there. The polar vortex was basically a strong jet stream that kind of confined that cold air up there. And what could happen is that very cold air, if it got this sort of scenario, if that very cold air goes south like it did, it brings um, an Arctic blast to us. Wow. And that's kind of... You're out of school yeah. for the cold temperatures. Mm -hmm. Well, good thing. Yeah, I'm like... People could, people out exposed would like lose your, yeah. especially sometimes little kids. Well, my yeah. daughter, 16, doesn't know how to protect her hands <laughs> from the gold. But, yeah. Mm. In New England, they call it the Canadian 
Express. The Canadian Express. <laughs> that cold air coming down. Here you go. Eh? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So this actually is why I brought this in here today. Okay. So um, we talked, and actually have a review slide coming up. I'm going to show you in a minute what we talked about with regard to surface winds. I feel like you guys get whiplash out there because we're talking about upper level winds. Now we're going to switch and talk about surface winds again. With surface winds, you have to kind of remember what's happening with regard to the Hadley cell. We have the easterly trades, okay? With the Farrell cell, we have the westerlies, mid-latitude westerlies. With the polar cell, we have the polar easterlies, okay? Um, and we also talked about how we kind of, where those cells bump up, we have these semi-permanent highs and semi-permanent lows. So this is actually a review, or oh, it's coming up. Yeah, this is the review. So this is, do you guys have this slide? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So the top one is in January, and the bottom one is in July. And I think you might have a homework question about this sometimes. You know this is in January. Hopefully you would tell me. How do you know this is in January? I'll the give cold air is further down to the Right, exactly. The cold air is farther down to the south. And how do you know that? Is it from a high to a low? Uh, that line in the middle. Exactly. So you're all on it. Yeah, that line in the middle. That's your hot spot. What's and it's farther down south. Uh, the intertropical convergent zone. Intertropical. Because we kind of think of the um, Hadley cells as the tropics. Intertropical convergence. And what's converging there are your easterly trades from both hemispheres zone. I know what I was trying to think of the other way. It's the other day. It's almost like the demilitarized zone. ITCZ stands for, or it reminds me of something DM, like demilitarizing zone. I don't know, in Korea or something. Okay, so yeah, so if we look at that purple line here in July, it moved up. And that's the wandering intertropical convergence zone. So it wanders up, and actually, remember we talked uh, on Monday this idea of um, this region right here. Starts with the letter M. What does that experience? I can't draw. I can't, probably can't spell, but here's the Himalayans. Oh, monsoons. Yeah. Yep, monsoons. This idea of the intertropical convergence zone moving way down in the winter and way up in the summer because of the, un the land heats up quickly. Um, that actually gives the, them their... What were we talking about? Oh, yeah. Okay. So oceans. Oceans. Of course, we know oceans have currents. And this caught my eye several years ago as I was teaching this. The way this works is that the red lines, they stand out a lot better. I guess they're all red. Wait. The red lines are supposed to be um, warm, and the blue lines are cold. Makes kind of sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the red lines are transporting um, warm air towards the poles. There aren't very many blue lines. Where's all my blue lines? There's some, There's some over there? Yeah. Okay. There's some. Good. Okay, so. You know, if, if there weren't winds, if there weren't winds, then the oceans, the large bodies of water, would not have currents. That's kind of weird. There were not, not winds above. Because the reason that the water moves is basically the air moves over it. And it basically rubs against it and carries it along. That's why there's currents. Okay. Now, the Mississippi River is not a good example because there's kind of a, um, if you want to think of it, kind of a, well, it's going downhill, right, for one, going from, anyway. But if you look at the Mississippi River, you can kind of see those chops, chop, 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 chop. That's because of wind. Um, one thing about the ocean currents, so I don't forget about it, but if you go down very far, the, ocean, the oceans are still. You go down very far. Why? Because it's kind of like you got your fastest moving um, water on top, and then it gets slower and slower and slower as you get below. So that's kind of cool. 
So anyway, you're going to see the next slide, and um, these uh, wind currents are going to create our ocean currents. So here we go, without further ado. So this is back to Chapter 7 now, okay? So these would be your ocean currents, and they, they, we have like individual ocean currents that make what we call a big ocean gyre. An ocean gyre means like kind of segmented currents together. And they are around, you know, if you go back to the previous slide, what my point was going to be is they are around semi-permanent high pressure. So I'm going to put an H here, H meaning a semi-permanent high pressure. Why is that high pressure there? It's there because the Hadley and the Ferrell cells are coming down, or air is coming down between those two cells, create semi-permanent high. We have another high here. As it turns out, we basically have kind of nice highs in the centers of our large ocean basins. I think that's, I think that's coincidence. But in the northern hemisphere, around a high, winds blow clockwise. And so if winds blow clockwise, then currents go clockwise. Okay, so let's see if we can see that in the northern hemisphere. You guys see that? If we pick on the Atlantic, North Atlantic Ocean, does it look like clockwise? Scoot over here, looks like clockwise. Okay, clockwise. You buy that? Clockwise. Round a high. What's it, what direction does it go in the southern hemisphere? Counterclockwise. So here we go. So those are your major ocean gyres. There are five of them. Okay? Very good. So one last thing we need to talk about is this idea, well, two last things, but the biggest thing we need to talk about is El Nino La Nina. Okay? And we're getting there. But before we talk about El Nino La Nina, I want to talk about kind of something that goes on um, kind of associated with the um, coasts. It's associated with coasts, and it's associated with kind of um, uh, layers of the ocean. So the term upwelling just, may, just means that basically in the oceans you are up bringing stuff up. And that stuff could be colder ocean water, but also, like the slide says, that stuff could be nutrient-rich water. Okay, like nutrient-rich, who cares about that? Well, we care about that. Because with the nutrients comes the green nutrients, like the plant stuff, comes the, um, the things that the fish can feed on. And of course, there's the whole, you know, big fish eat little fish, that sort of thing. And then there are the fishermen that rely on that sort of upwelling. So upwelling is important to humans, or to little critters and to humans. Okay, so upwelling is important. Um, what do, how does upwelling occur? Well, it occurs along the coast. And like this slide said, it occurs mostly, and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this, if you find the west coast, okay? All right, so here we are, North America. Of course, here's our west coast. <coughs> but honestly, we're going to spend some time talking about the west coast of South America. The west coast of South America. Upwelling is generally along the west coast of continents. And it's created, like this slide tries to describe, basically... You have um, your ocean gyre going um, clockwise, excuse me, going, yeah, going clockwise in the north, northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. It causes kind of a torque, okay, which causes kind of a vacuum, which brings up your, brings up your nutrients your, and your cold water. That's what upwelling is, and that's kind of how it happens. So think of our west coast as upwelling, healthy upwelling. We need it. And I'm going to talk about that when I talk about El Nino and La Nina. Okay. So before I get to El Nino and La Nina, I want to talk about kind of what normal is. In order to best understand El Nino and La Nina, you need to kind of turn your attention to this neck of the woods, South America. Okay? Now, when ultimately, and I'm going to show you a figure from your textbook, that this condition of El Nino or condition of La Nina, which, by the way, they go back and forth, is a global thing. It's a global thing, okay? Even though in order to identify its presence, we're going to look right here, okay? It's global. So normally what happens here, okay, this is the equator. Hopefully you guys can see that. So if that's the equator, then think Hadley cell, Hadley cell, right? Okay. So we have the equator, or excuse me, we have a Hadley cell here. Now, we talked that usually... Um, 
we said uh, you should have the prevailing wind in the Hadley cell should be an easterly wind. Okay, actually, if it's in the southern hemisphere, it's a southeasterly wind. Okay, that's usually what happens, right? So normal conditions, this is showing you, we see South America, we're going to talk about the, kind of the Peruvian current here at some point. Um, South America, and this ocean basin would be what, the South Atlantic, wait, South Pacific, sorry. This is the South Pacific Ocean Basin. This is the North Pacific Ocean Basin, because up here is California, blah, 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 okay? Pacific Ocean. So we have the Hadley cell. This is your, this is your easterly, southeasterly trade winds. They're, and it's meeting your northeasterly trade winds at the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone, right smack dab there. Normal conditions. Neutral, not El Nino, not La Nina. Notice that right here, under normal conditions, okay, this, and it's not drawn here, but it could be, this right here, I'm going to say normal upwelling, normal upwelling, smiley face. What does normal upwelling mean? It means it's got the nutrients. The other thing upwelling does is it brings cool water here, okay, upwelling. Um, when we talk about El Nino, La Nina, on the other side, we have um, Indonesia and Australia. So Indonesia and Australia, which is on my bucket list to visit. Okay, so this is what happens usually. So usually then, um, we with this high pressure over here, off of Peru, we kind of have relatively dry conditions, just like the slide says, that um, warm, moist air then can travel the Pacific, um, come over here uh, to this uh, low, and then actually it can be a situation where it can dump its precipitation. So Indonesia is very happy. Normal conditions. All right. Well, how does that compare with not normal conditions? So we need, we talked about normal. Now we need to talk about El Nino and the La, La Nina. What happens there? Well, right off the bat, hopefully, you're picking up with this, uh, this, this idea. What happened to your easterly trade wind? They're like, they're no longer easterly trade winds. They basically, like this slide says, I've heard it, they weaken or they even go backwards. Correct. So that's an El Nino year. That is an El Nino year. So if we kind of think what does that mean, well, it means basically, I'm going to put an X over there. I'm going to say no upwelling. Sad face. Now, I'm just kind of making this, I'm trying to make this dramatic, but... It is. So no upwelling, so it's warmer than usual, warmer and wetter than usual over here. You're like, dude, oh, that can't be good. Well, what does it mean for our friends over in Indonesia and Australia? Well, it means that they are going to be, like this slide says, drier than normal. Okay, this is just a condition that the earth has been doing for years and years, okay? And so honestly, the other thing is it's drier, and you can actually see the sea level drop. Isn't that weird? The, your sea level will drop. So how long does El Nino last? Oh, three to seven years, and there's a lot of play in that number, right? Yeah, like isn't there an El Nino going on? I think, I think we're just coming out of El Nino going into La Nina. But yes, it's been going on for a while. Exactly, exactly. Yep. So that's kind of El Nino. Um, it affects our snowfall and, yep, our temperatures, yep. Which years typically have more snowfall? It's coming up. There's a slide, so I don't want to butch it too bad. Okay, so I'll just put this whole thing up here. El Nino. And one of the things, and however, what kind of learner you are, you're going to want to kind of differentiate normal conditions from El Nino. But to me, right off the bat, if you say your easterly trade winds stop or reverse themselves and then kind of go from there, what else, what else happens, you know? And like I said, where do you identify it? Well, it's most likely identified between, you know, South America and Australia and Indonesia, okay? Um, um, I've heard that um, this kind of this region of the world between South America and Indonesia or Australia, I call that, I've heard that called the Walker cell, W-A-L-K-E-R, Walker cell. But notice at the bottom here, and we've ta been talking about what happens, 
um, weather, okay, the hurricanes, we call, we call tropical cyclones in our neck of the woods, we call them hurricanes. So hurricane <laughs> activity should be diminished. Uh, and I can never remember, but I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb here. So hurricanes, I'll put hurricanes down. This isn't just in general. That means they're less frequent. And I'm going to put tornadoes up. Okay, because they, I tracked it down one, one year and I tried to ask the ex experts, what do you, you know, what sort of activity would you project with regards to tornadoes? And uh, El Nino disfavors tornadoes. And wait, El Nino, El Nino favors tornadoes. Okay, so. Um, here's El Nino, uh, again. Now contrast that with La Nina. So finally here at the bottom, this bottom figure is La Nina right here. This is La Nina. And you almost have to like uh, study it to see what the differences are because you're like, oh my gosh, that looks like normal. But if you look a little bit closer, they are... Um, especially strong. So I'm going to put especially strong trade winds. You're like, well, what could be bad with that? Well, if it's especially strong, then you get extra, extra upwelling. I'll put extra here for, next to upwelling. If it's especially strong, you get extra upwelling. Um, that should make everybody happy, but it's especially cool here, okay? And everything's just exaggerated. You get wetter than normal over there, and it's just not a good thing. I think what I've read is El Nino events, worldwide events, um, are not do not last as long. Sorry, El Nino, El Ni La Nina, La Nina events are shorter than El Nino. Is what I was trying to say. Okay, so the kind of the back and forth between the two. El Nino and La Nina is called the Southern Oscillation. Kind of makes sense because what we've been looking at between South America and Australia and Indonesia is in the Southern Hemisphere. And again, we kind of call that the Walker cell uh, when it does it upper elevations. Um, so it goes back and forth. We call that the Southern Oscillation. Notice that um, if we are leaving an El Nino going into a La Nina, then maybe we'll have a worse than usual um, hurricane here. So we'll see. Hope not. You're like, why can't you just stay normal? Right? <laughs> and here's that figure from your textbook that looks at impacting. If you're like me, it goes, it's funny because these are both El Nino and the other one's La Nina. And they break it up by December to February, and then they skip, um, um, they skip March to June, and then they go June to August, and then skip. You know what I mean? I just think that's kind of funny. So this is kind of what's affected. If you find our neck of the woods, you can, and this might be, you might use this for a homework question. So if you want to put HW on this, you can. But if you find us... Where are we? Oh my gosh, I can't find this. I suppose we're kind of there, if you, broadly speaking. But is this how you guys read this? Like in an El Nino, like for June to August, I don't see us affected. Do you? Right. That's kind of how that works. La Nina looks like this. So La Nina, if I circle us, since it's all about us. Okay, we're kind of here-ish, and then we're here-ish. Again, La Nina, you know, does it affect us, you know, between June and August? No, probably not. Uh, a potential impact between, you know, December to February, so that's how you read that. So um, you would expect um, during uh, an El Nino, okay, an El Nino, Remember, that's where our trade winds are, have petered out, even reversed themselves. One of the things we said in El Nino is we said it would be warm. I like that red on black. Okay. This, what you're looking at right here, by the way, you're like, what the heck is that? That actually is this right here in South America. Okay. So that's your SA. 
Okay, we said it would be warm off the coast in El Nino. We said it would be cold, especially cold in a La Nina because your trade winds really kick in and you have more upwelling. So we can actually track sea surface temperatures, which brings me back to the movie The, the Day After Tomorrow where those, yeah, those people with the little buoys are yeah. checking sea surface temperatures change. Um, this is the Southern Oscillation, kind of going, this is from uh, 1965 to 2010. The reds are the El Nino, the blues are the La Nina. And do you kind of see where the blues, the La Nina, they, they look like they last a little bit shorter. And actually kind of see, maybe anyway, kind of what that looks like. This is the Southern Oscillation, going back and forth between El Nino and La Nina. So one last thing I want to talk about is kind of pulling things together, what we know about patterns, like um, air patterns, the Hadley cell, the Farrell cell, the polar cell. Now, clear at the end of the course, we're going to talk about climates. And this kind of verges, to me, verges on climates, is what I was thinking about today. Um, specifically, we're looking at precipitation, which when you define a climate, you're defining its precipitation, it's its temperature. So this, hopefully, you can kind of see our six cells, if you ask me, okay, because I got one, two, three, four, five, six. I know it's only three cells, but I still say it's six cells. So of course, the one and the four are the Hadley cell, the two and the five are the Farrell cell, the three and the six are the polar cells. And we talked about, um, you can kind of see the three dimensions on this slide, I like it. We talked about if you have a semi-permanent high pressure, which is what you have between your um, Hadley and your Farrell cell, that high pressure, that descending air, remember we said kind of creates your deserts, okay? Um, your low that's between the Farrell and the polar cell kind of creates um, a fair bit of precipitation. Whoops. And then we talked earlier this um, idea of a location along the ocean is going to be wetter, location inland is going to be drier. Depending on what side of the mountain you're on, you could get the rain or get the dry side of the mountain. So kind of in a nutshell, this is when a year goes on, this is how much precipitation these locations <coughs> get. So the darker the blue, the more the precipitation they get, the more the kind of light tan means it's very dry. So that's kind of pulling things together, what we've talked about in, in, uh, so far in the class. The other thing, though, and your book calls this kind of an anomaly, one of the things to try to kind of explain, here, let me go over to North America. Here's NA for North America. That's a W. That's an N, not a W. Find North America. The thing that kind of explains why we have kind of uh, wetness over there and kind of wetness over here actually is this idea right here, that in our ocean basins we have a semi-permanent highs that go clockwise in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. So dumping-wise, our eastern side of our continents are going to get dumped on a lot more because of that. So let's take a look right quick at your homework. So this chapter homework will be due on Friday, fabulous Friday. And it looks like this. So, let's see, it's a warm summer day. You're shopping downtown um, Chicago. And you get a breeze off of Lake Michigan. And remember we talked about lake breeze, or, ocean, or uh, sea breezes. I'll just put the word sea breeze as your hint there. Look them up. That is actually a sea breeze and answer the question, the complete sentences. Um, two says that actually it's another small breeze. It says you are in Colorado, yay. You're at the foothills, uh, eastern foothills of the uh, Rockies. And it says um, what type of wind is bringing this downslope wind? Um, I'll give you the first letters. I'll give you CH for that wind. 
Then here, I think I mentioned that sometimes on my unit exam, although I don't think I can do it this year because I did it last year, I'll give you a figure sort of like this, and you have to match up um, these terms, plug into your figure, so it's kind of a good one. That, you don't have to use complete sentences. Explain why the west coast of continents generally experience cold ocean currents. Um, I'll just say today's figure, um, today's um, figure of ocean currents. You're going to see that actually along our west coast, on the west coast of continents, that ends up being a, a from the poles. It's kind of cool in both hemispheres. And then last but not least, we have this one. So here's where, remember one of the last few slides today, we looked at um, kind of the sea surface temperatures. And we said, and to me, um, uh, my hint here is, to me, this looks kind of warm. It looks unusually warm. And you kind of have to track that down. If it's extra warm over there, that means no upwelling. That means your easterly trades have petered out or reversed themselves. OK. So kind of say what that is. All right. Very good.